Thank you. So I want to start out by thanking uh, Brazos Bookstore for, this, for hosting this event, as well as the Harris County Democratic Lawyers Association. I'm uh, very grateful to all of you for putting this wonderful event together. Um, I am put at ease uh, by the number of uh, friends and colleagues who are here tonight, and I want to thank all of you as well. Uh, <coughs> I also would like to thank the first editor of the book uh, who is here, uh, my son Andy Garcia, <laughs> uh, as well as the designer of the book cover, my husband Jim Thompson. <laughs> Um, so just to tell you a little bit about how all this uh, came to, to be, um, in 20, the spring of 2012, I got a phone call, um, and I'm normally pretty quick to hang up on solicitors, but this one said, uh, Houston City Attorney. Uh, so it piqued my interest, and I answered the phone, and it was Dave, David Fellman, the uh, uh, city attorney at the time for, for Houston. And uh, he let me know that Mayor Parker was considering appointing me to a new board of directors that would oversee uh, rem taking the Houston Police Department Crime Laboratory out of the organizational structure of the department and making it an independent forensic laboratory. And I was, you know, thrilled by this. I normally, you know, uh, get very anxious when people want to appoint me to another committee, but. In this case, I was really excited because I had been doing research in the area of wrongful convictions for some time, and I was aware of the problem of having uh, um, laboratories lodged within police department organizations, and I was a strong proponent of making them independent. So I was thrilled to hear that we were even going to do this, um, and then to get to be a part of it was, was all the more exciting. And so, and so began the odyssey that led to uh, the publication of this um, book. Um, so uh, Tim has already given you some of my background. Um, you, know, you might also be interested to know I'm f from Laredo uh, originally um, and a product of the public schools there. Um, and after college, I went to New York City, after law school rather, I went to New York City and I was a prosecutor in the Manhattan DA's office for two years where I did some appellate work and s some trial work. Um, and then I'm happy to say, as, as Tim mentioned, that I just finished my 25th year of law teaching um, where I study, uh, teach mostly uh, criminal law and evidence. And uh, a big part of our work uh, as law professors is writing. Um, so for the first 10, 12 years, most of the focus of my work was uh, relating to the war on drugs, right? So my experience as a prosecutor had made me very interested in uh, policies relating to the war on drugs, and I, I specialized in civil asset forfeiture, which is kind of an odd subject, but I thought, you know, this is really what's driving um, so much of the policy is the money. Um, and so I wrote about that, and then in the year 2000, Congress uh, enacted the Civil Forfeiture Reform Act of 2000 um, and incorporated a lot of the things that I had wanted them to do. Um, and so I thought, okay, my, my job is done. Um, what should I write about now? Um, and around 2006, um, I was having a conversation with one of my students uh, who asked me a very intriguing question. You know, he said, if eyewitness identification evidence is so faulty, then how is it that you can convict someone based only on that? Uh, and I thought that was an, something I really couldn't answer, and so it led to a, a law review article, which led to uh, you know four or five others, um, and I you know developed a little specialty in eyewitness identifications and wrongful convictions, which. Um, in turn led to uh, Governor uh, Perry appointing me to the Timothy Cole Advisory Panel on Wrongful Convictions. And we worked on that uh, advisory panel from 2009 to 2011, um, ha you know, put out a report that uh, proposed a number of legislative changes, and some of them were adopted, including, uh, you know, Texas now having um, the best model policy for eyewitness identification procedures in the country. I'm really happy about that. Um, so I believe it was my work on that advisory panel that um, led to Mayor Parker um, considering me for this board of directors for this new independent lab. And like most Houstonians, I was very well aware 
of the problems with the HPD crime lab. Uh, so beginning around 2000, in, well in the, exactly in the year 2000, um, there you know, were media reports about serious uh, problems with the HPD crime lab. Um, and those, are, those news stories continued um, until probably 2010, maybe even later. It was unrelenting bad press for many, many years, even though HPD was making serious efforts to try to improve the lab. There just continued to be problems. So when I got the call from Mr. Fellman, I was really excited to try to be part of the group that would make um, some fundamental changes at the lab. And you know, forensic labs are really, really critical to um, outcomes in criminal cases. Um, so I, I felt very passionately about this subject. But at the same time, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into, right? So um, I knew enough about the issue to know that there was likely to be uh, resistance um, and we know Houstonians you know we're, we uh, there's plenty of tense political stuff that goes on here just like everyone everywhere else so I was expecting a political battle with HPD I was wondering if there would be a battle with the district attorney's office I was wondering about how the board would get along and whether members of the board um, would have you know confrontations and so it was uh, you know, something I wasn't, I, I wasn't sure what I was, what I was going to be facing, but I was ready for it. Um, the other thing I was worried about was that I, uh, I knew really nothing about forensic science. <laughs> uh, and that struck me as, a little, as something of a problem. Uh, if I was going to have something intelligent to say uh, about how this uh, laboratory, uh, you know, could be extracted from the police department and then reformed to make the management uh, work better, I realized I needed to, to bone up on the subject. And so that was when I decided to turn my research agenda uh, to forensic science issues exclusively. And so uh, beginning in 2012, I, this, is what, this has been my life's work. Um, and the, you know, the funny thing is initially when I thought about writing this book, I thought it would be really easy. So <laughs> my original plan was to write something like a memoir uh, and I could just sit back and talk about what I was experiencing and who I was meeting and what we were doing. And, uh, and everyone would just, you know, take my word for it that it happened this way and it would just be like writing a novel. I thought, oh, that'll be so much fun, such a nice change of pace from my normal kind of work. Um, but I, as I got into it, I, I realized a few things. <laughs> I realized I that was completely wrong. Um, because the Houston story is really every city story um, nationwide and every state and even at the federal level. This is a national problem. It's not unique to Houston. The plan that we were, uh, you know, um, promoting with uh, making the lab independent, that was unique and that was worth telling, but my real audience had to be national if, you know, if, if I was going to make this book um, really meaningful. And so I set out to make the case for independent labs at all levels of government, lo um, local, state, and federal. Um, and I knew that law enforcement and the f forensic science industry would be opposed to this. Uh, so <coughs> that meant that I couldn't just write my story and trust that everyone would believe me. I had to carefully document um, everything that I, every assertion I tried to make, I had to carefully document, and I knew that the book w would become a target. Um, so, you know, I've, I tried really hard in the book to be as fair and even-handed as I could, and to document everything um, really